No. Okay, we, we covered the surprises, my warm welcome and intro. Okay. So um, I am not a big surprise person, but I also like when it's like a good thing, right? When it's a good surprise, like, hey, I'm, um, I just got this great thing I want to give you, like little gifts out of nowhere, like that's fun. Those are good surprises. The disciples, when um, Jesus was, uh, had died on the cross and three days later he was resurrected, some of them were not even expecting it. In fact, um, Jesus told them over and over and over again, in three days, I will come back to life. And they just didn't know what that meant. They thought, well, maybe the end of the world, because I know that the end will all be resurrected in Christ. But that is not what happened. It was an ordinary day for most people. And surprises are like that, good or bad. Just going along, minding your own business. And then there's a surprise, good or bad. And after the crucifixion, after Jesus was buried, it was just an ordinary day. You know, women and men went back to work. The Roman soldiers, they switched shifts, you know, and went back to guarding. I, I don't know what they did back then. I tried to look it up. What was life like in your 33 AD? Go ahead and Google it. It's a lot of fun. It takes you down a rabbit trail of this is no use for me at all. But for many others, the resurrection of Jesus and what happened at his death, there was, I like the word, seismic shift. There was something so incredible and so terrifying that it changed the trajectory of many, many people's lives and eventually affected you sitting in this room today. So turn with me to Matthew 27. We did read part of this at um, the Good Friday service. And when I was reading it, I could hardly get through it because I'm like, that's right, this happened. And we kind of glaze over this huge, surprising thing that happened when Jesus died that led into his resurrection. So Matthew 27, it's towards the end of the chapter. Let's see, verse 50. And it'll be on the screen too. If you have your Bible, I use a New Living Translation just because it's easy to read out loud. I'm a reader, I'm not naturally a speaker, so I need like the simplest version that I can say out loud without messing up all the big words. All right, it sounds like most everybody's there. It says, then Jesus shouted out again, this is when he's on the cross, and he released his spirit. All right, this is the, the seismic shift, the incredible things that happened when he died. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. I don't know if I ever fully give justice to this incredible event. And I think about it a lot, um, especially this time of year. What was that like? So it says the curtain in the sanctuary, the temple, this was Herod's temple. It was actually a new temple built by Herod because the other ones had been destroyed in war. Um, but it was a place for Jewish worship. And it says that the curtain was torn in two. Have you guys ever seen anybody like Oh, I had a crazy guy in high school I went to high school with, and on the last day of school, he, like, ripped his shirt. Ah, he, was, he was, yeah, poor kid. Like, now I'm like, oh, my goodness, that dude. He's like, ah, right? And so sometimes that's the imagery that comes when it says the temple, uh, the curtain was torn. I just think, like, God's hand, ah, like this. But to get some kind of scale for this, it was 60 feet, let's see, high from top to floor, 60 feet by 30 feet wide. Now, it could be like hyperbole, but it said that it was as thick as a man's hand, and it took like teams of horses to pull the curtains apart. So it was like a big, heavy curtain. This wasn't just, you know, flimsy cloth with a little tear in it. This was like a major thing that, that it was torn into. Now, why does this matter? Why does it matter if there was a curtain that was torn in the temple? Well, that curtain was keeping separate... God from all of the people. Once a year, a high priest was designated. They drew straws, like who gets to go in to the holy of holies and take some blood 
and, and go sneak in and, and put it on the altar as a way of telling God, like, please forgive us our sins. In fact, it was such a terrifying thing that they would tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest going in, and they had like little bells on their robe. And so if they hear the bells going in and they're going to go put blood on the altar, like look up blood and I'll sacrifice things later, but blood on the altar, if it ever, they ever heard like a thud or all the jingling stopped, they're like, oh, too bad for this guy. And they'd just pull him out. Nobody could go in after him when the presence of God was in this most holy place. Other times a year, there are probably women that would go in and dust and clean, which is what our coffee group talked about. But when the presence of God was in this place, no one could enter in to the holiest of holies. And it said that the curtain that separated it was torn in two from top to bottom. I'm always curious about the Pharisees who went in and realized what had happened. Like, how did this happen? And tried to sew it back up again. Nothing to see here, folks. But Jesus made a division and said, no more am I going to be separated from people. God's now able, God is now able to be with his people. I will be their God and they will be my people and no longer will there be this separation. That was incredible. The second incredible thing that happened is this line where it says that the, um, that the stones, like it was an earthquake and the rocks fell apart and the tombs split open and the bodies of many, the people, many godly men and women walked out of their tombs. Now, how surprising would it be if you're just sitting at home, like finishing up Passover, so now you can do other things, and your Sabbath is over, so you get back to work, and you hear a knock at the door, and you're like, Grandma, like, oh my goodness, what are you doing here? Um, so Jewish tradition of burial is they don't just bury people in the ground right away. What they did is they put them in these tombs, and then once the, it was just down to the bones, and they would take the bones and hold the bones for the second resurrection. And so there was, like... So the, the tombs are kind of like burial spots, but it wasn't a permanent burial. After Lazarus and the three days that Lazarus was in the tomb that Jesus called him out, we can see that this could have happened. Now, again, it could also just be saying like, like many godly men and women were seen there, but I want to read the Bible for what it says because people rising from the dead after Jesus' resurrection is hardly the most surprising thing that we can read in the Bible. I mean, read accounts of the heaven, of what heaven looks like in Ezekiel or Revelation, and you realize people coming back from the dead is not the most ridiculous thing that you could read in the Bible. We don't see it as often now, but we know that Jesus can do it because he has all power and authority to do that. But a good surprise. Now, the reason that this matters so much is because we're about to celebrate people getting baptized in a, a, a death to themselves in water. If we hold them down for too long, what's going to happen? That's it. So, so there is this trust thing going on, right? You trust that, you know, mom's going to bring you back up, daughter's going to bring you back up, dunk him twice if you need to, you, five times, we'll wait around. But it's this death to self and life again where we get to be the godly men and women walking around our Jerusalem and telling people about the change that happened in us. This is an incredible, miraculous thing. All right, the third miraculous event, and this was probably the one that has, to me, is the most incredible knowing the history of it, is... Um, the Roman guards, and I didn't put it up in the scripture because I, you know, it's a lot of slides. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the son of God. Now, if anybody in that time had heard these Romans say, this man truly was the son of God, capital S, son, capital G of God, they would have known what a terrifying thing this could have been for the soldiers because their allegiance wasn't to God. Their allegiance was to who? Caesar. And Tiberius, who was the Caesar, all the Caesars then had like these God complexes. They would have these long, elaborate names as they claimed who they were. You read Revelation in light of what was going on in this time, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, Tiberius, who reigned when Jesus was crucified, 
His title was Emperor Tiberius Caesar Augustus, Son of God. Now, you can imagine how terrible it would be for Christians who are just new to their faith, and you say, now you need to call this guy Son of God. And you're like, but I know Jesus, and so I cannot. And thereby, that's why you have all the martyred saints, because they refused to call anyone else but Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God. So the Roman officers and his soldiers saying, truly he was the son of God. They looked at the earthquake, they said the sky was darkened for three hours, and then these, the dead people came back to life. These guards probably lost their job. They probably were done then. They probably had to run for their lives or get martyred for their faith. If they were to claim that somebody other than Caesar, Tiber, Emperor Tiberius, was not the son of God. It was a really, really big deal. Now, I, of course, I love everything, um, science and uh, the eclipse coming up. Like, this is a really big deal, right? The eclipse next week, and we have all the things about make sure your eye covering Well, uh, is there. And they said, well, was there an eclipse during Jesus' death? Because science is predictable. So they said, well, maybe it wasn't like the sky was darkened, like literally. Maybe it was like a natural event. And I said, no, there was no eclipse on that side of the world. But there was, the sky was darkened for three hours, from noon to 3 p.m. And not only that, but Jesus on the cross didn't accuse anybody or hate anybody or say anything. But what did he say? Three words, Father, forgive them. Right? That's all he did. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And then he cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eloi. Lamech Sabathani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He gave up. It's incredible. And the Roman soldier's like, man, we've never seen anybody die like this. Nothing. The most incredible, miraculous event at the crucifixion was the fact that these people who were following after Caesar turned their allegiance and claimed Jesus to be the Son of God. It's incredible to me. Um, Oh, so this is the thing I was going to say about eclipses. Um, so we have one coming up next week. In 2099, Ohio will have another one. But if you're really interested in seeing another eclipse, you can go to Portugal in 2026, or you can go to Nome, Alaska in 2033. Like, these things happen on a regular basis, right? It is scientifically predictable. And um, it's how God set up the world. And I love that, that we can study science and fall more and more in love with God. Like these two things are not in conflict with each other, but rather they just point to the incredible creation that God has made, especially when your surprise is that little second line on the pregnancy test. And you just think about the incredible life that we all started as, right? So God has this. But you see, the God who made the rules is also the God who can break the rules. So the doctor can tell you all he wants to, but if God says, no, nah, I'm going to heal that, then you're healed. Your, uh, your marriage might be on the rocks, and all your friends are saying, nah, give up. And you say, no, but God says, if I continue to pray and seek his face, that he will, he will answer me. It says, never stop asking, never stop seeking. So God, who has made the rules, is also the one to break him. And the most amazing, miraculous event, of course, to show that Jesus is not just the one that can take our sins, but is also the one who has the authority to forgive our sins, did not stay dead. He came back to life. Um, that is in uh, Matthew, we can read from Matthew 28. And we put it out there on the wall in front of that photo booth, because I think this is the most incredible thing. says, early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. They were coming in after their Sabbath to bring in the spices to anoint Jesus' body. And when they, there was a great earthquake, so is this the second earthquake then? Another earthquake that split rocks open? I don't know, I didn't research that. Let me know what you find out. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. I love it. 
it doesn't probably end well with those guards later on because they were not guarding the tomb. Then the angel spoke to the woman. This is in verse 5. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. Surprise. He has risen from the dead just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And so they went into the tomb and saw where the cloth was, where the th veil, the thing over his face was, and they're like, yeah, the angel was right. And then they went rushing back. In one account, one gospel account, it says the angel said, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Because remember, Peter had that great falling out where he just denied Christ over and over again. And so the angel told the women, make sure you go and tell Peter too, because even though he denied me, he needs to come in here and see this. God speaks to us exactly how we need to hear. You're not just a face. You're not just a number. You matter to him, and he has a plan for you. So um, then it says the women ran quickly from the tomb. They were frightened but filled with great joy, and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. What's incredible, incredible to me in this is that um, surprises, good or bad, or God working and breaking the rules can cause all sorts of emotions in your life. It can cause excitement, it can cause joy, it can cause fear, like what does this mean for me now? I have never imagined my life without this thing that's been attached to me for so long. I've never imagined my life in a new way. And it says um, they were filled with great joy because the message of Christ, the peace of Christ was filling them even if they did not fully have the full gift of the Holy Spirit that won't come until Pentecost. And as they went... Here's the best surprise. Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they're going to see me there. It's incredible to, incredible to me. And, and the fact that God entrusted women to go and tell the news was a really big deal back then. For some Christians, it's still a big deal that women get to talk about things. But... Uh, it was incredible because could women be trusted? They thought that women's testimony wasn't any good, and yet God entrusted the least and the lowliest with the message. And you might feel today that you are the least or the lowliest, but God has something for you. I keep reiterating that, that be ready to be surprised by God. Um, we're about to have the bapt we're going to do the baptism, so if somebody needs to go and grab the kids here in just like two minutes, um, I would appreciate that. They, they knew they didn't have a lot of time, but if you can go and interrupt their class. So then Jesus walked around, and in Luke's account, I believe it says that 500 people got to see Jesus, besides the disciples and these women, that, that 500 people, and then I think about the people that were broke out of their tombs, that said they hung out in the tombs until the resurrection of Christ, that it is the most incredible thing is that the story of Jesus kept going forward. It wasn't just 12 people. It was 512 plus extra people that heard the word about Christ. And then here at the end, and this is where I'm cautioning you that when you're surprised by God, that you will have a choice on how to respond, either with gratitude, thank you, I believe God has broken the rules for me and I'm just going to thank him. Or you can have that response of like, I don't think God has anything for me. I don't trust him with my problems. I don't trust him with my forgiveness or I'm just not there yet. Wherever you are, know that God understands where you are. He really does. Matthew 28, this is, the great, um, this is right before the Great Commission. It says in verse 16, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Even with Jesus standing right in front of them, some of them still doubted. I hope that makes you feel a little bit better. Because it isn't that they were discounted, they couldn't be there with Jesus. It doesn't mean that they at some point did not believe. But at that moment, they're like, was that really him? What we do know is that signs and wonders, it says, will accompany those who are filled up with God, 
So one of the miraculous things that happens when you say, God, I'm not sure I believe, is that he will fill you up. He will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. Even in your doubt, you can say, God, I'm sorry, help me overcome my, my disbelief, my unbelief, and he will do it for you. He is that good. He is no respecter of persons. And then Jesus came and told his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and teach other people to believe in me, baptizing them and teaching them to obey. Baptism is what we're going to experience now. That is the, the incredible work of God in somebody's life. Like those Roman soldiers who said, um, surely this is the Son of God. I must believe or the disciples that were following Jesus, poor Thomas, right? They call him Doubting Thomas, and maybe you've heard that quote out of context. It was the guy when Jesus appeared to them in the inner room says, I'm not going to believe that you're the Christ, even though you just walk through a wall. I'm not going to believe it unless I can see the scars in your hands and the scar in your side. And Jesus, instead of looking at Thomas and saying, believe me or not, whatever, dude, he said, okay, sure. Sure, it's fine. Ask me for a sign. Be brave and ask Jesus for what you need. Ask him. Today, Resurrection Sunday can be a new day for you and a different day. Um, I saw Bob going to go get changed. So... You're giving an opportunity today to be surprised by Jesus, and you have to believe that a supernatural God, the one that created all that we see around us, that created each of us uniquely, does not have to follow in the bondage of the laws of nature. He can break them. And then he gives us power to live as Jesus lived in this world. So once you said, hey, Jesus, will you just help me out here? you can go public with your faith. So after you've admitted your need for a Savior, you believe that he died for you, you confess your sins and say, man, I, I need some help here. Then you go public. You get baptized. You join a Christian community. You're welcome to come to Awake Church, but you can go to any you know, church that God leads you to. And then the third thing is, is that you start serving God with all of your life, everything, not taking any sort of counterfeit, and we're going to be talking about that more next week. Um, I'm going to see when he comes back in. I'll just share with him the scripture afterward. My scripture to those that are getting baptized today is from Romans 6, 13. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Amen? Okay. We are going to pray. We're going to have some baptisms. And then we're going to sing another song uh, together just to celebrate the Resurrection Sunday, the resurrected Christ one more time. Um, I am sure there's a lot going on in your life, but again, if you need prayer for anything this week, if you just need to stick around and have me pray for you, um, I would love to do that for you. Um, but if not, uh, stick around for the song, and then um, we will be dismissed at the same time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the, the miracle of Jesus' resurrection. And I know that some people will still doubt a miracle. But we know, God, that you do not have to follow any of the rules of nature. That there are going to be ways that you break your own rules because you love us, because you're merciful, and because you have a plan for our lives. Wherever our pain points are, God, whether it is just um, in independence and we're ashamed of admitting that we need a Savior, or if it's just like, like an embarrassment about going public with our faith, I just thank you that you are kind and you are patient and gentle. But help us, God, not to delay, not to delay that obedience and that step of faith. As each of us in here today 
ask for you to show up this week. You don't have to, but you do because you love us. I just pray that we would be surprised by you. In Jesus' name, amen.